first. There is no team in the entire NFL like the Steelers. The bond that these players share is like no other. And now the stories of this brotherhood are finally being told in this new book called Their Life's Work. And it's the brotherhood of the 1970s Steelers then and now by author Gary Pomerantz. It includes more than 200 interviews with players, coaches, and scouts, and some great old photos, too. And it is officially being released today. And we are thrilled that Gary is here to tell us about how he put it all together. Gary, good to meet you. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Well, the Steelers are so beloved in our city, but I think it was really from back in the 70s that made that love so strong. Tell us, first of all, what made you want to write and tell this story? Well, first off, it's the greatest team ever, or at least since the Earth's crust cooled, right? <laughs> I visited uh, Latrobe, Pennsylvania way back in 1981, and I was a young, impressionable sports writer, an intern at the Washington Post. My assignment was a dream assignment go to Latrobe and see if this great dynasty was finished. And, and I interviewed Terry Bradshaw, John Stallworth, Chuck Knoll, uh, Franco Harris. I remember sitting with Joe Green and thinking, as he was speaking, this guy's bicep is wider than my thigh. <laughs> uh, I, I'm happy to report all these years later, or unhappy that my thigh is now bigger than Joe's bicep, which probably isn't good for either one of us. Uh, but, but now at a time when, when football is under the microscope, particularly for concussions, I thought if, if I examine the game, for what it gives and what it takes, who better than this great team? And follow them across the decades to today. So did you figure out what it was that made them so great? I mean, winning four Super Bowls in six seasons between 74 and 79, what was it? Well, first off, great players. Yeah. Uh, you know, they had nine Hall of Famers, all of the names familiar to your viewers, but there was something deeper there. There was a closeness, there was this brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Players today are not gonna know a brotherhood like this. Why? because of free agency. Players are jumping team to team for bigger contracts. There, there's, uh, you know, th this team was together 10 years and more. And so they knew each other intuitively. They knew the women they loved, the cig cigarette brand they smoked, they knew it all. And, and so now what I see across time, particularly now as they're getting older and a number of these guys have passed away, most recently, Elsie Greenwood, that's when you really feel that bond, it's unshakable. So let's talk about um, the past, and then I want to get to today. Um, t what, what kind of stories did you find? Anything really unusual or surprising to you? Fun stories, poignant stories, hilarious stories. One of my favorite Joe Green stories was actually before he got to the Steelers. Before he was mean Joe Green in high school, he got kicked out of about 10 games one season. He would intentionally run over the, the officials oh in the middle goodness. of the game. Well, there's a story where after one game, they'd lost again. Joe's in a, in a diner and the opposing team is there and he's not happy they've just lost so he smears an ice cream cone in the face of the the opposing quarterback he climbs back onto the team bus and somebody throws a bottle at joe you don't do that to joe green and joe stormed the bus and he pried open the front door of the bus climbed in by the time he gets in the bus everyone's cleared out the back of the bus so he wouldn't known as mean then but he was wow there's a reason for the mean joe green who were um so you interviewed how many people for this well, more than 200 interviews in all, and uh, the players were very giving of their time, their stories. And I should say about Joe Green, you know, the emotion from that day still lives in him today, not in terms of rage, but in terms of, you know, the, the feeling for teammates. He has now given eulogies for all three of the other members of the Steel Curtain front four, Ernie Holmes, Dwight White, and now Elsie Greenwood. Joe will tell you, I don't do funerals well. But these guys are feeling their mortality, and as Franco Harris will, would say, and John Stallworth, it's time now not for, for us to celebrate the time we had together, but also the time we have left. So what about these premature deaths, as it seems? Um, was it because of the football? What did they think? Well, there were 12 men who died before the age of 60, but of wide variety of causes, mm -hmm. disease, cancer, heart attacks, accidents, um, a cocaine overdose. Mike Webster stands a bit apart from the rest. Mike Webster uh, played football until he was 40, a much loved teammate and clearly one of the greatest centers of all time. But part of his legacy now is that, you know, he died at 50 and was the first NFL player diagnosed with this brain damage known as CTE. Mm -hmm. And so you have to put this with that Steeler legacy, along with those four Super Bowl trophies and those, those 12 Hall of Fame busts in Canton, go those stained slides of Mike Webster's brain. And what do the players think should be done about that? I mean, do they feel like, you know, they are glad that they did what they did or are there some regrets? No regrets. Every one of these guys would tell you they would do it again in a second. 
That's what the game took from them. You know, titanium in the knees, hips, shoulders, but what it gave them was each other. Well, what about now? Do they think the same should be, you know, no, nothing changed, or should, should things change for the current players? Well, I think they would agree with some of the, uh, the changes that have been made in terms of protecting defensive backs, quarterbacks, the, the guys out in the perimeter. But I think they would also say football's football. It's mm -hmm. a hit and be hit game. Joe Green will, t will tell you, as he told me, uh, that the, some of the hardest hits, helmet to helmet, are between the tackles. And you can't legislate those out of the game. Yeah. It's football. Yeah. Well, we are lucky to have a lot of these great guys still in our area, of course. Um, Rocky Blyer, we see Lynn Swan here a lot, Franco Harris. So we get to see what some of them are doing. But what are some of the other guys doing now that they're out of football? Well, of course, Terry Bradshaw, most famously, is, mm -hmm. uh, is a television uh, celebrity, sportscaster. John Stallworth uh, really impressed me in interviews for his, his depth of, well, of inter introspection. He, he thinks deeply about these guys, and he's had an amazing career as a businessman. You know, the book is called Their Life's Work. It was what Chuck Knoll used to say to his players all the time, and some took it as a threat. You know, when they were released, he would say, you know, if I were your father, you were my son, I would tell you it's time to get on to your life's work. Hmm. Well, John Stallworth got his MBA before he left uh, the Steelers, went back home to, to Alabama, and built an information technology firm in the aerospace industry and sold it for $69 million. Wow. Now a minority owner of the Steelers. Uh, a very high percentage of these guys have gone on to great success. Not all of them, certainly not all. Yeah, and tell me some other fun stories that were revealed in, in these interviews that people may not know. You know, one of the st stories that was really meaningful to me was about the players had this hideaway where no press, no coaches allowed. It was post-game, and of, of all places, the sauna uh, in Three River Stadium. At the stadium, okay. At the stadium. <laughs> now only lives in our memory, Three River Stadium. But, but after home games, they would gather there, and there was some beer in there, and they would just sort of move in and out. There were some mainstays, Jack Lambert, uh, uh, Mike Webster, some of the guys who liked their beer. Uh -huh. And, and the, the conversation in there was just unvarnished. You know, they would kid each other about missed tackles, missed blocks. But uh, Terry Bradshaw would say, it was the most fun we ever had because it was just us and we laughed. And you know, the next day was an off day Monday. So it was like the beginning of shore leave. So that's, this is where you build that esprit de corps, where the brotherhood forms. It was very special. Well, and I know you touch on some people who are not just players as well, because um, one of our interns this summer, or I'm sure, sorry, this fall, is Bill Nunn's granddaughter. So I had fun reading about him and his role as an African-American with the Courier and then with the Steelers. I'm glad you brought him up. He's really one of the unsung heroes of the dynasty, and I just met his granddaughter. I, I know her <laughs> father, fitting. Bill's son, the actor Bill Nunn, uh, a great family. And Bill is still with the Steelers, still doing game films. Fantastic guy. Yeah, she said, I think he's uh, 91, I believe. I think he might be 89. Sorry, 89. sorry to age you. <laughs> 89 and still doing great. Well, that is so cool. And what about the coaches and the, the Roonies? Were they amenable to talking? Uh, they were all great. They were all great. I was not able to get to Coach Knoll, uh, but uh, Dan Rooney, Art Rooney Jr., um, the entire coaching staff, uh, they were all in. And, and I think once everyone got to understand what I was after, mm -hmm. uh, they came to respect my ambition. Uh, they were fully engaged and they had great stories to tell. I bet. Well, Gary, thank you so much for sharing this with us in your book. Congratulations thank on you. its release today. And come hear more stories from the life's work, the brotherhood of the 1970s, Pittsburgh Steelers, then and now, at the book launch party. And this is going to be tomorrow night at the Heinz History Center, 6 o'clock. There will be an all-star Steeler panel with legends, including Franco Harris, Rocky Blyer, Andy Russell, and Dan Rooney, and, of course, author Gary Pomerantz. You can call the Heinz History Center or go online for more details.